Thank you very much. It's uh, wonderful to be here, my first visit to Budapest. Um, I'm very happy to be here and be part of this conversation about the current state and possible future of scholarship about vernacular photography. It's especially interesting to be speaking in a Hungarian context with its own local practices, histories and interests. This is a context with which I'm almost entirely unfamiliar. In other words, I've come to learn as well as to share my own thinking about these issues. When considering how best to contribute to our discussion, I thought I might begin by engaging some of the basic premises of the symposium itself. I might condense these into three propositions, each of which I think deserves some debate. First, the notion that vernacular photography speaks a universal language. Second, the claim that vernacular photography has been, and I quote from the website, traditionally excluded or downplayed by curators and historians. And third, the consistent association of vernacular photography with banality. Let me begin with this last proposition first, <clears throat> the idea that ordinary photographs are banal, that is, unoriginal, obvious, boring, and with it, by extension, the presumption that art photographs are somehow less so. Now, it's perfectly true that most ordinary vernacular photographs are somewhat banal in the sense that, at first glance at least, they are pictorially repetitious, conventional, and almost entirely socially conformist. However, as an historian, I think we cannot glance away from that fact. We must look at it directly. We must acknowledge that this indeed is part of the nature of vernacular photography. On the other hand, I've long held the view that there are no such things as banal photographs, only banal accounts of photography. True, the vast majority of photographs, whether vernacular or artistic, are somewhat unoriginal, but none of them is boring if you look, choose to look at them in an unboring way. At the risk of proving myself spectacularly wrong, let me offer you a few examples from my own recent writing about ordinary photographs. It is striking to take but one genre I had been collecting lately, how frequently women chose to have themselves photographed in carte de visite in the pose of reading a book or letter. The trope allows them to claim to be literate at a time when this was an attribute that had only recently become common among middle-class European women. Such photographs are therefore a celebration of both education and liberation, a visual confirmation of progress for their sex. They are also photographs of thought and thinking, a making visible of an otherwise invisible and unseeable process. Moreover, to be shown reading a letter is to imply an exchange of epistles has taken place, or will take place. It is to say you can write as well as read. Silent though these photographs are, they are all about women insisting on their right to have a voice in social and, and ultimately political discourse. Of course, the figure of a woman reading has a long history in the art of painting. Johann Vermeer, for example, painted at least three compositions showing a wealthy woman reading or writing a letter, thematically linking them to his other scenes of women absorbed in domestic tasks and to connotations of, of affection, longing, and desire. This connotation, though, is not implied in carte de visite. No hints of romance, romance are offered. These letters are likely to have come from other women, from sisters and friends. We are asked to witness one node in a network of relationships that extends well beyond the edges of the photograph. What we also witness is the mimicry by commercial photography studios of the affectations of high art, signaling that having been superseded, such codes are now available for plundering. To photograph someone reading, or at least pretending to read, is to turn a private moment into a public one. For these are photographs, like the letters, made to be sent and exchanged with others. Did these women bring these letters to the studio with them? Or are they props provided by the photographer, as impersonal as the desk or chair or potted plant that also populate these scenes? It's odd to see women standing up while reading. Perhaps they also want us to see the fall of their dress, to admire their sense of fashion. It underlines our suspicion that these women are self-consciously acting for our benefit, 
that the scene is an artifice composed to send a message. The women pose for a portrait in which they look away from the camera, in which they refuse to meet the gaze of the viewer. They instead show themselves lost in their own thoughts, occupying an interior world of text and the imagination. They show themselves and yet withdraw that same self from our unfettered perusal. They hold something back. It's a powerful subject position for women, no doubt used to an endless scrutiny of their appearance from both men and other women. One of these women looks up from her book to meet our look with her own. For once, we know what she is reading, as the cover of her book is clearly visible and intended to be. It's an 1884 edition of Laurence Stern's Tristram Shandy, first published over a century earlier, between 1759 and 1767. The book is a complex and offered learned parody of biography as a form of literature. Its style of write writing marked by digression, double entendre, and startling graphic devices. It demands the reader's interpretive participation in the text, as that reader seeks to make sense of its stream of consciousness, narrative structure. In the 19th century, some critics considered it obscene, given its descriptions of sexual relations. In other words, this woman is making quite a statement in this photograph, not only about her intellect, but also about her willingness to embrace avant-garde ideas and flights of fancy. She invites us to join us in this other world, thereby turning an otherwise ordinary portrait into a dangerous provocation. As a figurative pictorial form, these cartes de visite offer me the possibility of inventing a specular narrative about their possible meanings. But what about photographs of nothing? How do I make something of them? One of the stranger series of photographs held in the collections of the J. Paul Getty Museum in Los Angeles comprises a set of identically sized daguerreotypes. Each of them is laconically described by the museum catalog as a daguerreotype plate with no image. This isn't to say there is nothing to see. Indeed, perhaps in the absence of a distracting pictorial presence, one is able to see even more than usual. For a start, one gets to look closely at the daguerreotype's actual substrate, at what lies beneath those shiny pictures for which this, this medium is usually admired. That in turn encourages us to consider the daguerreotype process itself, its constituent elements, the actions needed to harness those constituents to the production of images, and the strengths and limitations of that production. In short, these blank daguerreotype plates invite us to contemplate their own mode of being in the world. Renowned for its fide fidelity to whatever scene it records, the daguerreotype was one of the earliest photographic processes to be invented. It was the end product of a long series of, ex of experiments by two Frenchmen, Nicephore Nieps and Louis-Jacques Mandé de Guerre, beginning in the 1810s. By 1839, when de Guerre was in a position to name the process after himself, it had come to involve a complex series of techniques involving a camera, a sheet of copper, and the combination of silver, iodine, and mercury. The process was therefore dependent on machine components and refined chemicals and minerals newly made available by colonial trade networks, producing a sharp and detailed image on a piece of metal unmediated by the human hand. The daguerreotype was obviously a product of both industrial capitalism and imperialist ambition. Daguerreotype was therefore also contingent on, while contributing to, many of the, their associated social, cultural, economic and environmental consequences. After being thoroughly cleaned and polished, a silvered copper plate was suspended over iodine, leading to the formation of a light-sensitive solution of silver iodide on its surface. That iodine was derived from kelp. As one English scientist commented to a friend in 1840, and I quote, you are aware that iodine is used in de Guerre's process for getting the solar drawing on his silvered plate. Who would have anticipated that the discovery of a violet-colored gas in the refuse of kelp would lead to such important results, unquote. Who indeed? Complying with the dimensions of the back of the camera used to expose them, these particular daguerreotypes are all six plates and are therefore a sixth of the size of de Guerre's first full plates. Despite this reference back to the medium's French origins, they seem to be American-made examples. 
they also seem to be failures if the creation of a discernible image was the original aim. Instead of such an image, a portrait, say, we are confronted with a set of raw metal surfaces, scratched by rough handling and variously colored and blotched by chemical deformations. Sometimes they are also impressed by the name of the manufacturer of the plates. It's a reminder that making daguerreotypes was always difficult and unpredictable, and that failure was a constant possibility. How interesting then that these examples were saved and preserved, first by their photographer and now by this museum. Today they come to us framed by our knowledge of modernist abstract painting, making them capable of eliciting a certain kind of aesthetic appreciation. But they also come to us as examples of photography. And in this, their most potent guise, they surely challenge all our preconceptions of what this term might entail and what kinds of, photo, uh, what kinds of objects photo historians might consider writing about. Fast forward a century or so, and we encounter yet another type of photograph beloved by ordinary customers, but not much given much attention by historians. Street photography is a genre of commercial photographic practice where people walking in the street are photographed without their permission and are then offered the opportunity to buy a copy of that photograph. In the 1930s and 40s, you couldn't have walked down a major street in any Western city and not be snapped by such a photographer. This one happens to have been taken in Wollongong, a city to the south of Sydney in Australia, where I myself come from. The subjects in these pictures are in motion and are often, but not always, aware of the photographer, even sometimes smiling for him, as one automatically does in the presence of a camera. But they are not fully they are not yet fully in compliance with that photographer's wishes, not yet party to a financial transaction or even to a conversation. The photographer is about to offer these people the opportunity to purchase a copy of the exposure that has just been made. To that, to that end, the camera they are looking at may well be festooned with such photographs, acting as a convenient advertisement of its own capabilities. This kind of photography is dependent on certain technological developments, in particular, rapid exposure times and direct positive paper that allows for instant development. You might have thought that focus would be a problem if the subject is moving, but th this could be solved if, if the camera was placed at a set position and the shutter pressed just as each group of subjects reached a particular mark on the pavement. An experienced photographer could set his focus for that distance and take many sharp exposures without having to constantly adjust the camera. Such exposures were often taken in threes to ensure at least one good shot, resulting in a cinemat cinematic stop motion strip of people moving through pictorial space. It's interesting that people did actually buy these kinds of photographs, despite their relatively poor aesthetic, aesthetic values. At a time when most people didn't own a camera, these photographs meant something if you and or a loved one happened to be in them. Street photographs are based on remarkably consistent pictorial principles. They are almost invariably in a vertical format and postcard sized, showing people relatively well dressed and prosperous looking. There would be no point in photographing someone who obviously could not have afford to buy a print. They were usually shot from slightly below, but without spatial distortions, which might again preclude a sale. The subjects are more or less centered in the picture plane and looking either ahead or in the direction of the camera surrounded by a partial view of the street and its architecture. The practice began in Australia shortly after the Great Depression in the context of mass unemployment and continued on until about 1950 when these kinds of photographers were finally banned from the streets by the city council. The photographer and his subjects came from different class stratifications. A working class photographer captured a candid image of middle class subjects an exact reversal of the situation for, say, American documentary photographers in the same period. <clears throat> Buying a street photograph therefore involved a quite particular kind of transaction between one class and another. As with so many other acts of consumption, one of the things a customer gets for his or her, her money is an affirmation of their class status via a confirmation of class difference. Street photographers were usually hired by established studios who would rent them a camera and give them a day's supply of film and then set them loose in the street. 
photographers would stake out a territory and basically photo photograph everyone who walked by. Working on commission, they were entirely dependent on making a sale for their income. It was, in other words, a tough business to be in. After each shot, a potential customer would be handed a business card on which was marked the number of the film, the place where the contact prints from the film might be viewed, usually a booth in a city arcade, and the time when such, when such contacts might be viewed. The repetitious nature of their pictorial values and the ordinariness of the images themselves might explain why street photographs have remained relatively invisible in the history of photography. For these kinds of photographs, authorless, commercial, uncreative, cheap, available everywhere, refuse to make themselves available to the three central organizing principles of photo history as an official discourse, innovation, biography, and nationalism. They refuse, in other words, to adhere to the demands of an art history of photography, the mode of historical evaluation that, even now, continues to dominate and, I think, distort accounts of this medium. Instead, these street photographs just walk on by. What about real photo postcards, as they were once known? Where do they fit into the story of photography? The postcard officially began in 1869, when the Austrian post office issued a plain card already imprinted with a stamp. The stamp side was intended for an address, and the other side was meant for any written message. Three million of these invitingly blank cards were sold in the first three months of their existence. This was despite fears that such a mode of correspondence, where the writing was displayed in public for anyone to read, would erode all sense of privacy and decorum, as well as literacy, messages having to be short and pithy. Postcards therefore represented a collapse of the distinction between public and private, and from the 1890s, when picture postcards began to be issued, a collapse also of the difference between the visual and the written. In 1904, Eastman Kodak introduced a brand of photographic papers uh, with the words postcard already printed on the back, thus allowing both amateur and professional photographers to begin to make and send their own real photo picture postcards. A change in the rules, allowing writing and an address to appear on the same side of the card, coincided with Kodak's introduction of an affordable, easy to use and portable folding pocket camera that made postcard size negatives. Photographic images could now be printed from these negatives at one to one size at home onto, a, onto thick card stock that came with pre-printed postcard backs ready for, an, for a message and an address. This gave any image that appeared on them far more clarity and detail than was possible with photomechanical cards, given their machinic dot patterns and garish colors. The popularity of real photo postcards meant that they didn't stay amateur for long. Very soon, these kinds of photographs were being made at state fairs and similar venues by professional photographers using this same sort of pre-printed postcard stock. Clients would thereby offer the chance to enjoy their own photo op complete with a painted backdrop or prop. Established not long after the distribution of George Méliès' pioneering 1902 animated film, A Trip to the Moon, one particular genre included a painted backdrop depicting a star-studded night sky. It also included the occasional comet, inspired by the passing of Halley's Comet in 1910, and inevitably, a large wooden crescent of a moon on which portrait customers could sit or lean. During the same period, there was a resurgence of popular interest in the romance of the moon, as evidenced in countless Tin Pan Alley songs, such as Shine On Harvest Moon from 1908, By the Light of the Silvery Moon, 1909, and I'll Sit Right on the Moon and Keep My Eyes on You from 1912, none of which I propose to sing today. The resulting photographs show otherwise ordinary people literally swinging on the moon, as another popular song would have it. Indeed, the popularity of this particular postcard is evidenced in the lyrics to yet another song, It's Only a Paper Moon, written in 1932 and sung by, among others, Ella Fitzgerald and Frank Sinatra. Associated with both romance and lunacy, these photographic keepsakes encouraged imaginative flights of fa fancy, both for the subjects and their observers. In particular, they allowed their subjects to enjoy space travel half a century before such travel, in fact, became possible. 
From Europe to the United States to New Zealand, thousands and thousands of people were photographed sitting on a moon against a starry sky during the first few decades of the 20th century. These were photographs made to be touched, to be turned from one side to the other, to be both looked at and read. Produced cheaply and rapidly, today they are often faded or marred by the oxidization of their silver surfaces. The sheer repetition of the tropes suggests that such, such pictures were commissioned and sent in the expectation of eventually receiving something similar in return. But not necessarily immediately. Unlike letters, no space was designated on a postcard for a return address. In any case, Many people sending postcards did so while on holidays and therefore on the move. The sending of a postcard was therefore an existential gesture more than a dialogic one. Before you read anything written on it, a postcard sent to you says, here I am, I exist, I am thinking of you, and by sending you this card, I am now insisting that you think of me. We should remember too that these are, that these are postcards, not just novelty photographs and so they usually come with a handwritten text on the back. This one was sent from Rockford, Illinois to Parkersburg, Iowa in August 1912. The text on the back refers us to the front so that reading and looking and a turning from one side to the other is built right into this object's morphological, this conceptual morphology. Quote, Dear friends, we were delayed but we'll see you this week. We are spending a few days in Rockford and we're out to a track, perhaps a racetrack, and this is the way we looked. In other words, sending and receiving these postcards stitched you into a social exchange system not dependent on you literally sending one back. Meant as a shared joke, sitting on a moon, real photo postcards, thereby allowed for a trafficking of humour between senders and recipients across attenuated passages of time and space. They are, in short, a distinctive form of photographic science fiction. So far, I have used the opportunity to talk about ordinary photographs as an excuse to ruminate on a number of related issues. But theology hasn't been one of them. That's about to change. That's because I also want to speak about snapshots and about one kind of snapshot picture in particular. The shadows of photographers have appeared in snapshots ever since such photographs were first taken. There are thousands, perhaps even millions of examples produced wherever snapshot photography has found itself, which is to say, everywhere. You could almost say that it is a genre preordained by Eastman Kodak and it's you press the button and we do the rest style of camera, a camera sold to the masses as an instrument able to be operated entirely without skill. We've been anxious to prove them right ever since. The shadows in these photographs, in other words, have been cast by consumer capitalism itself as much as by any photographer. Among other issues, a focus on this particular genre of snapshot allows us to engage in a kind of sociological study of the act of photographing. In these pictures, we actually get to see this act taking place. In fact, photographing and being photographed is what this kind of picture is of and about, whatever its other nominal subjects. An analysis of a large number of such pictures might tell us all sorts of things about photographing. About, for example, a, necessary certain, a certain necessary body language. About the gender of the photographer. Even about the make of the camera being used. Some shadows hold their camera up to the face, while others look down into a viewfinder. We even sometimes see who is present at the shoot, standing along with the photographer, and now with us on this other side of the picture. It would be easy to see such traces as mistakes, evidence of the ineptitude of the amateur behind the camera. But one could equally see these shadows as deliberate additions to the picture, turning them into group portraits in which both subject and object are figured in eternal union. Indeed, in some cases, the shadow is so prominent, entirely filling the foreground, as here, that it's hard to imagine that the photographer did not see it before depressing the shutter. Surely it's meant to be there, or at least, it doesn't change the function of the picture if it does happen to be there. Frequently, that shadow touches the subject of the photograph, literally joining the inside and outside of the picture and the bodies of the photographer and the person being depicted. This is your shadow too, of course, 
the observer and the photographer being interchangeable entities in front of such photographs. You too are reaching out and touching this woman into perpetuity. In every case, the shadow abruptly enters the scene before us, puncturing its pictorial illusions, its promise of a window onto a frozen moment from the past, and reminding us of, insisting upon, each photograph's particular means of production. It reminds us that these photographs were made as well as taken. What do we see when we look at such photographs? We see how a person looked then, but also how we look at that person now. That looking is inscribed here in a shade of black, as if by peering in, we have only just now blocked out the sun. Present and past are shown in permanent communion, much like the photographer and the subject, and these photographs and yourself. Like every photograph, the snapshot is an indexical trace of the presence of its subject, a trace that both confirms the reality of existence and remembers it. The snapshot potentially survives as a fragile talisman of that existence, even after its subject and its photographer has passed on. We are thereby reminded of why we take such snapshots, to provide witness to this existence, to declare, I was here in visual terms. This is surely what drives us to keep on photographing, rather than the intrinsic qualities of the pictures that result. Photographs like this, in other words, are all about photographing rather than about what is being photographed. They record the appearance of friends and loved ones, but also, and more urgently, they confirm our own presence in time and space, and thereby deny the possibility of death. They stop time in its tracks, and us with it. But therein lies a paradox. That very same photograph, by placing us indisputably in the past, and thus certifying the inexorable passing of time between now and then, is a kind of mini death sentence. It's a prediction of our, of our own ultimate demise at some future time. Every snapshot, no matter what its subject matter, embodies the same strange message, speaking simultaneously of life and death, even while suspending us somewhere in between. The addition of the photographer's shadow, of a metaphorical shade, a ghost, works to make this message a visible rather than merely a subliminal one. Its presence in these snapshots poses the question of whether this suspension of time is in fact the ultimate subject of all photography. In other words, we might well regard the taking and keeping of these shadowy photographs as dogged declarations of faith in an afterlife in the midst of an otherwise increasingly secular world. So far, I've tried to persuade you that ordinary photographs, vernacular photographs, although indeed unoriginal and repetitious in form and ideology, are nevertheless far from boring. However, however, I suspect that no one in this audience really needed persuading. More contentious, however, is the proposition that such photographs offer us a universal language. So look, let's talk about that for a moment. All the examples I have shown you so far come from a quite particular social and cultural context. They were all made within a Western cultural setting for a middle-class audience or market. This is, in fact, a local setting, but can sometimes seem universal thanks to the colonial imposition of this culture's values, worldview, and pictorial practices on the rest of the globe. How can we engage with the local within this global economy of image making? When I first published an extended essay about vernacular photography back in 2000, I insisted that my topic should be pluralized as vernacular photographies and argued that among these, among these many photographies, we needed to acknowledge not just ordinary photographs, but also what I called neglected indigenous genres and practices. My essay especially mentioned gilt Indian albumen prints, American painted and framed tintypes, Nigerian abeji images like this one, and Mexican photo escultura like this hybrid object, part sculpture, part photograph, part memorial, part Catholic icon. In extending the term in this way, I was encompassing the full range of meanings of the word vernacular in the Oxford English Dictionary, which include both ordinary and ubiquitous, but also local, as in the expression, speaking the vernacular. These kinds of local, indigenous, and regionally specific artifacts, I said, quote, necessarily speak to us of difference 
of cultural difference, but also of photography's own differences from itself. I was reminded of the disruptive potential of indigeneity and difference during a recent stopover in Singapore, where I got to visit that city's national gallery. While, while there, I saw these two painted and framed photographic portraits hanging on a wall. The label that accompanied them describes them as ancestor portraits. An accompanying catalogue offered more details about the function of photographic ancestor portraits, a common genre in Asia. These ones were made in about 1920 to be shown in ancestral halls for peoples of para-Ankanan heritage, that is, mixed Chinese and Malay Indonesian ethnicity, across the Strait settlements, Singapore, Penang, and Malacca, and the Dutch East Indies. Now they sit in a state institution, a national gallery, displaced from their place of origin and motivating function, but still retaining hints of their difference from the usual portrait photograph, especially if you happen to come from the culture in which they were produced. According to one of the catalog, catalog's authors, Roy Ung, and I quote, ancestral photographs offer a, a focal point where spiritual and temporal worlds could converge and meet, and where children of the diaspora could personally witness and feel geographically close to forebears who had emigrated directly from China during the 19th and early 20th centuries. The addition of paint on the surface of the photograph, along with a wood frame and its slightly concave glass layer, gives the portrait a distinct presence, a materiality more palpable to the senses than that provided by the usual flat two-dimensional photographic image. Such photographs, solemn and stately in pose, and often taken for precisely this posthumous purpose, played an important role in funeral ceremonies, providing a medium for the spirit or abu of the deceased ancestor to inhabit. After the funeral, the photograph is venerated as an object of worship for 49 days before being moved into the family's private ancestral hall. While there, it acts as a conduit for the spirit of the ancestor when she is invited to visit, a visit encouraged by the burning of incense, the display of enticing foodstuffs, and the addition of a sample of soil from the gravesite. The photograph is thereby mobilized, animated by an inhabitation to become an activated participant in the life of the family. Given the intensity of this presence, a separate ritual must then be performed to politely request the spirit to leave. We in the West tend to treat the portrait, portrait photograph as something that pictures someone captured in and confined to a past moment, becoming, after the subject is deceased, as one scholar has put it, a commemorative image to signify the static, permanent, and radically decontextualized nature of death. But as we've just heard, this may not be the case in some Asian contexts. Accounts of the role of photographs in similar mourning and ancestor worship rituals, for example, in places like Korea, suggest the possibility of a more complex understanding of both death and photography. As Korean scholar Ji Hae Kim has written, Korean funerary photo portraiture serves neither as a memento mori nor as a signal of absence. Within the worship rituals, it signals that the past visible presence has been transformed into a now, now invisible presence. In other words, the ritualized photograph suspends the departed in the ghostly temporal space of a will be here rather than, rather than as we often say in the West, a that has been. In short, a history of photography that wants to include objects like these will have to recalibrate the flow of time itself and certainly rethink the temporal character that we habitually ascribe to the photograph. As I've already suggested, that character will have to be pluralized. Photography will have to be reconceived as a singular plural noun, as photographies. This brings me to the final proposition that motivates this symposium, the claim that vernacular photography has been, and I quote, traditionally excluded or downplayed by curators and historians. I've already complained a number of times myself during this very talk that the history of photography is still often presented in terms established by the discipline of art history, and that these terms exclude ordinary photographs from serious consideration. But perhaps my complaints are by now out of date. After all, here I am, a scholar who writes about vernacular photographs, who also happens to be the professor of history of art 
at the University of Oxford, not exactly a hotbed of radicalism, and referring to, in a talk in Budapest to an essay I published 23 years ago in the leading journal in the field of photo history. What do I have to complain about? And even before the appearance of that essay, the Museum of Modern Art had mounted an exhibition of 350 snapshots in 1944, claiming them to be, and I quote, an important American folk art. And John Sikowski had included one snapshot, borrowed for the occasion from a private collection, I hasten to say, to represent all of them in his valedictory 1989 exhibition in the same museum, entitled Photography Until Now. And so it has continued. Here are the covers or catalogues of exhibitions devoted to the snapshot, which was shown at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art in 1998 and at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York in 2003. And here are two of my own exhibitions about vernacular photography, shown at the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam in 2004 and the Izu Photo Museum in Japan in 2010. When faced with these examples, among many more like it, you would be hard pressed to argue that the world's major museums have been ignoring or devaluing vernacular photographs. In similar fashion, the last time I spoke at a major symposium specifically devoted to discussions of vernacular photography in 2018, it was hosted by New York University, one of the world's leading academic institutions. But the context in which that gathering was held might give us pause for further thought about the current ways in which ordinary photographs are being represented to us by curators and scholars. For Imagining Everyday Life, as that symposium was titled, was sponsored by the, the German collector Arthur Walter, in part to focus attention on his own voluminous archive of such photographs. These photographs are often shown in exhibitions in his private museum or are included in books published by his foundation. In both cases, we are frequently shown juxtapositions of work celebrated by the art world, such as grids of photographs by Berndt and Hiller Bescher, with images by African photographers like Malik Sidibe or Seydal Keita that have been transformed from vernacular to artistic objects by that same art world. In summary, the vernacular turn that was initiated in the early 21st century has now become typical rather than exceptional. The fact that the Volta collection comprises both portraits by Richard Avedon and criminal mugshots, both works by the Beshers and by Sidibe and Keita, and regularly exhibits them in the same space, suggests that any clear distinctions between commercial, artistic, and vernacular photography have long since dissolved. I worry about the ease of that dissolution. The art world has always had a rapacious capacity to absorb the ready-made into its economy especially if that ready-made can be subsumed to the mesmeric taxonomic pleasures of the grid. Mr. Volta's own collecting was inspired by his interest in the work of the Beshers and their adoption of a dispassionate vernacular mode of photography. And he continues to favor ordinary photographs that exhibit a remarkably similar, gridable aesthetic. Deadpan and relentless, this type of photography's systematic repetitions of form impose a welcome order on an otherwise unruly world. Capturing criminals and blast furnaces with equal dispassion, it promises control over whatever is seen, even over seeing itself. But we need to remember that with many vernacular photographs, a repetition of form from picture to picture is a consequence of technical, commercial, or institutional necessity not of the photographer's desire for taxonomic order or an interest in aesthetic innovation. When mug, sh mug shots are shown next to a suite of work by the Beshers, they are asked primarily to provide evidence that the taxonomic urge is to be found everywhere we look, from high art to vernacular practice, from New York to Bamako, from council or police records to spectacular private collections of photographs. Of course, a trace of their original disciplinary purpose can't help but shadow our perception of these once vernacular photographs of criminals, even in such a setting. But their potential for offering insight into the mechanisms of power and the politics of photography can no longer be confined to the generous gesture on our part of simply including items like these in the history of photography. What matters, I'm trying to persuade you, is how we include them. This imperative is what links my thinking back in 2000 and my, my own more recent work as a scholar of photography, 
as embodied in my 2021 book, Negative Positive. This is a little ad because I noticed there are copies of it outside. I've always known that there is nothing particularly radical or disturbing to the status quo in simply adding vernacular examples to the pantheon of photography. What has to be disturbed is the whole system that supports any such pantheon. What is needed, as I argued in the last line of that essay back in 2000, is, and I quote, an eruption that promises to transform not just this history's object of study, but its very mode of existence. This sentence is a reminder that the isolation of vernacular photography as a separate category was always intended to be an incendiary move, to serve as a call for a transformation of the history of photography in its entirety, in the way it was organized, in the way it was written and displayed, and in the way it accorded value and meaning to its subject. Notably, I use the word abject to describe all the photographies I discussed in that essay, whether ordinary or regional, calling on the work of Julia Kristeva to associate these photographs with, quote, what disturbs identity, system, order? What does not respect borders, positions, rules? The in-between, the ambiguous, the composite. It was in this quasi-revolutionary spirit that I then proceeded, arguing not just for the inclusion of vernacular photographs within the existing history of photography, but for vernaculars to be made the, as I put it, organizing principle of photography's history in general, for a vernacular theory of photography to be advanced. In summary, I claim that vernacular photographies demand the invention of suitably vernacular histories. I believe that this is the challenge that is still with us, despite the current ubiquity of the term vernacular photography among scholars and curators and collectors. In fact, now that the term has been so firmly established in the lexicon, I propose that the time has come to abandon it altogether and instead speak only of photography. It is time to abandon the maintenance of artificial divisions between art and its other and treat all photographs in the same way, as equally valuable representatives of this bigger phenomenon we summarize for convenience with the single word photography. This is what I have tried to do in negative positive to provoke thought by looking at photographs by Man Ray and snapshots by now unknown makers with the same critical rigor and analytical tools, by treating them both simply as photographs, each with their own local contexts and functions and their own fluid array of possible meanings and significances. At least by that means, we can entirely focus our attention on what particular, on what particular photographs do in the world, wherever they are found, rather than what they are or what they once were, or what category they best fit. For I believe only by engaging with what photographs are actually doing can we mount an effective argument about, why they, what, about what they still might become. And this is surely what we should all be about. Thank you for listening. <laughs>